Good evening, everyone. So today we have Professor Senthil P. Kumar sir with us. So he is very. Uh, I'm very thankful to him that he accepted my uh, invitation to take a lecture for all of us so that we can learn. I have learned a lot many things from sir. So we learn a lot today also. Uh, so let me introduce. Actually, sir, don't need any introduction, but then still just a formal thing that mm -hmm. I'll introduce him. Uh, he is a chief instructor of AOMPT Academy of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapist. He graduated MPT Manual Therapy from Manipal University in 2003. His teaching experience of 10 years at Manipal University in Kasturba Medical College, Mangalore. A total teaching experience of 16 years. He is invited speaker in 149 conferences, resource person for 115 workshops. He presented 38 papers and won 19 first prizes in conferences held in 13 countries. He also took 250 plus webinars this lockdown and having 1500 plus members in his academy from 32 countries. Rated five star for all his online courses of AOPT on Facebook. I know this is a very, very short uh, introduction of Sir. Uh, he is one of the best researcher that I know in the world, one of the best researcher. So thank you so much, Sir, for uh, accepting the invitation to teach us uh, still more. So now to you, sir, to start with your lecture. Uh, pleasure to be part of this unique uh, venture, Dr. Butt's Physiotherapy Education Series. And uh, to make sure that, you know, vigorously we should spread the passion of knowledge across the SP Uh, what is important here is sir being a resource person himself and also a renowned uh, manual therapist, a chiropractor, okay? And uh, it's always a great mutual inspiration whenever I know sir's achievements. And more than all these achievements and being a resource person, being a student, okay, in that also sir is inspiring me, okay? So that's how uh, we all get better by positively influencing each other. And it's a great opportunity and I really cherish and I wish all of you good luck to enjoy this session. Uh, today's session, the first 15 to 20 minutes, I'm going to show you a slide presentation, small, short presentation, because I am talking about ortho joints, myo muscles, and uh, neuro nerves. So the three impairment based uh, reasoning in manual therapy when it comes to peripheral mechanisms. What do I mean by peripheral mechanism? Pain arising from the tissues that are related to the pain in that region. That is peripheral mechanisms. Central mechanisms, pain mediated in the brain. Okay? So you might have pain in the hand, but the pain process is happening in the brain. Then it is called as central mechanism. So peripheral mechanisms, we have this category, articular, myofascial, and neural. And we have known manual therapy techniques over the years. We have manual techniques, including osteopathy and chiropractic. They all utilize myofascial techniques, articular techniques, neural techniques. And you see that patient is usually identified for their symptoms when they come with pain, which affects their activity. So they have problem. If foot and ankle problem, Maximum patients will complain that on walking, it is the heel pain or is it like during running or sports activities? Okay, when they play football, they got a twist of the ankle and then they have a pain or climbing downstairs, they got a twisting ankle and then they have symptoms. Some of them have pain early morning when they keep the few steps and later the pain becomes better like in plantar fasciitis. So commonest problems, we are not seeing the conditions today. We are going to see the ortho myo neuro manual therapy. Okay? And then next one with respect to foot and ankle, how we are going to apply our thinking process into this. Because I know uh, the members of AYMPT are familiar with this term ortho myo neuro manual therapy. But however, the non-members and first time participants of manual therapy webinars may not have heard the name. This is a new registered clinical approach of the Academy of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapist. It's registered 
okay in the year 2016 and this is a very very novel technique to integrate articular myofascial and neural as a single technique okay that means at the same time simultaneously we are influencing the joints we are influencing the muscles and we are influencing the nerves also okay in the combination so that is how this technique is different from all other techniques of manual therapy which is existing and uh, commonly what we do a patient comes tell the tells that the foot and ankle i have pain we ask them during walking weight bearing is it paining if weight bearing is paining joint is getting compressed so compression intra articular okay within the joint cartilage or damage synovial membrane or uh, loose bodies within the joint will have pain when you are compressing the joint okay whereas capsules if the capsular strain and tears are there which is periarticular or extra articular that will be symptomatic in distraction okay so when you actually open the joint so for example ankle close packed position versus the loose packed positions okay close packed position is compression that is maximum dorsiflexion and eversion okay so that is the close packed position it's a combination of dorsiflexion and the eversion in the subtalar joint okay so both are there to create a close packed position maximum compression of the talus to the ankle mortis and if you see in terms of loose packed position it's a slight plantar flexion from the neutral even 10 degrees plantar flexion is considered to be a loose packed position where the movement is more in a general term you want to identify a foot which is rigid foot versus flexible foot rigid foot is stiff flexible foot is hypermobile okay hypermobile foot how do you identify by the foot shape in terms of high arched or the low arched foot high arched foot means pes cavus okay where the medial longitudinal arch is more deeper okay that is the supinated foot which is a stiff foot okay the force will be transmitted to the knee and hip whereas the other type pes planus which we are mostly familiar where it's called as the pronated foot and that's a hypermobile foot which is actually having what is called as shock absorption ability it won't transfer the force to the knee and the hip the foot itself will absorb all the forces okay so that is the pes planus so the difference between a supinated foot and a pronated foot in posture itself is important okay when you observe and the next one is in a supinated foot the pronation movements will be restricted okay there are components for supination there is components for pronations for example in the ankle in open kinematic chain if i am showing supination and pronations if i am showing in terms of plantar flexion inversion okay and adduction so i repeat plantar flexion inversion adduction adduction is towards the midline okay and inversion is twisting motion okay towards the midline plantar flexion this is supination whereas pronation is dorsiflexion eversion and abduction okay and you know this components itself will create pronation components will create a flattening of the arch supination components will create a exaggeration of the medial longitudinal arch so identify the foot type first okay so if it is pes planus it's likely that the patients will have soft tissue injuries like plantar fasciitis or ligament sprains okay whereas if it is pes cavus the high arched foot they are likely to have articular abnormalities okay because it's a stiff foot you need to mobilize okay whereas hypermobile foot you will try to see in terms of after release you will give a strengthening or a motor control proprioceptive training programs because the foot needs the intrinsic muscles to be actually stabilizing it for the arch okay and when it comes to orthotic management or evaluation of footwear when you see this uh, foot and ankle disorder uh, patients is most important you will ask them is it uh, your foot symptoms are changing with different surfaces or is it changing with different footwear the moment they tell this yes you should evaluate the footwear and make sure that supinated foot you have to correct the uh, 
uh, dysfunction there by creating a lateral wedge so that the arch will be reduced because it's a high arch you have to reduce it supinated foot you have to correct it okay in supinated foot if it is high arched foot which is best caris otherwise it will cause genuarum medial tibia femoral osteoarthritis okay it will progress to all the other uh, parts of the chain and the next one pronated foot don't try to give a medial arch support okay you will always support the foot you will not try to correct the foot so what you will prefer to give is a silicon insole okay the full sole insole is there you can put it on the sandal chapel or the shoe you can wear that and then uh, the sole insole will mold to the shape of the foot so that patient's uh, symptom will be much better when they are challenged by the uneven surfaces okay so or extra activity demands okay so keeping this in mind okay from the symptoms to posture and also the foot for wear okay everything you should relate remember occupation is another one and the age of the patient will have another criteria where children will have hypermobile foot and whereas the elderly will have a stiff restricted foot which actually causes the balance issues so you will be including neuromuscular training all this as part of the rehab in elderly and whenever you see any kind of symptoms in bilateral foot think of connective tissue disorders systemic disorders okay so be it uh, even uh, hepatic or uh, what is called as the right heart failure they will have edema in both the feet okay or the diabetic neuropathy which will have uh, distal symmetric uh, that numbness burning sensation in both the feet okay so everything is bilateral there okay when it is unilateral likely to be maximum mechanical history of trauma of course it's very important to always identify between macro trauma versus micro trauma because macro trauma always affects ligaments capsule joints bone okay micro trauma affects the muscles and the nerves okay rupture of muscles in the foot and ankle tendon achilles very rare it might happen okay once in a while otherwise the other muscles none of them go for rupture they always go for tendinitis okay overuse injuries and the same way nerve also nerve strain i would like to refer uh, differentiate between strain and sprain okay remember whenever clinically you are mentioning you should use sprain for acute injury s p r a i n s p p for peacock that is acute injury Whereas strain, S T R A I N, T for T, okay, and that is actually a chronic injury. So overuse injury will be called as a strain. A sudden injury, a twisting, a forceful motion where the foot is got stuck, and then a body turns in a specific direction will be called as a sprain. So if we say ankle sprain, that means it's a sudden injury. If I say ankle strain, that means it's a cumulative trauma. and the same way cumulative trauma always affects the muscles and then only it affects the nerves usually but in people who have vitamin b12 deficiencies those who have zinc deficiencies and also will have uh, calcium or vitamin d deficiencies before affecting the bone it affects the uh, transmission across the neural membranes so nerve metabolism will be altered or even a history of diabetes or hypertension vascular diseases uh it will affect the nerves okay so in those people nerves are vulnerable okay otherwise muscles are the first line of defense so first onset when somebody is having kind of a foot pain you should always think rule out the myofascial system okay and then next what you will see is rule out the neural and then you go for the articular so it, it's in terms of m n a myofascial neural articular okay the abbreviation ones so we are aware of articular techniques okay we have uh, what is called as joint mobilizations okay uh, when we find a stiff ankle joint so i might stabilize the talus and mobilize mobilize the talus while i am stabilizing the tibia and the fibula and giving a posterior glide for example talus which will improve the dorsal flexion of the ankle this is a maitland concept okay 
And the same way, if the same, I am giving a posterior glide to the talus, at the same time, ask her to take the foot up. Okay? Keep moving the foot up. Okay? So take it up. Up, 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 up. When she is doing the movement, I am synchronizing my force together with the movement. Okay? And my arm is also moving together with the foot. Okay? You can see that. This is a mobilization with movement, which is the mulligan concept. Okay? And the same way, a sustained force, which she can do by standing or weight bearing, will become McKenzie concept. Okay? In order to correct the postural deviation that is present. Whereas, when you see in terms of giving a deep transverse friction massage, okay, I keep the fingers like this, keep the thumb, okay, and then give this for the lateral collateral ligament, the anterior talofibular ligament. Then what will happen is the deep transverse friction massage is a Syriax concept, which is also articular concept. Because under articular is capsule ligaments and joints. Okay, joint means articular cartilage, synovium, all the structures, intraarticular meniscoid, everything. And the next in articular is Edwards concept. What is this Edwards concept? Combined movements. That means I might dorsiflex, I might divert, okay? Or I might plantar flex and I invert, or plantar flex and divert, or dorsiflex and invert, or invert. Okay, dorsiflex invert, plantar flex invert, dorsiflex invert, plantar flex invert. Okay, these are all different combinations. And I can check the joint because usually the capsule impingement is there. Okay. So that happens and you can detect it by the combined movements. You can also give the mobilization in a combined direction. Similar to the proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation which gives a diagonal pattern for the foot also. Okay. And uh, the same combined position, the end range, is the one which you, you are using for the thrust manipulation techniques. Okay. The high velocity, low amplitude thrust manipulation techniques. So where you are giving a, for example, a dorsiflexion aversion, and then you are giving a quick thrust, okay, in order to improve the range beyond the dysfunction position within the anatomical uh, available range of motion. So all these five concepts: Maitland, McKenzie, Mulligan, Syriax, Edwards. And also together with the thrust manipulation sixth will constitute the articular concepts. At the same way, myofascial concepts. Okay. First and foremost is the presence of spasm. Okay. Whenever you have uh, severe inflammation, acute protective reaction, patient will always keep the foot in a typical position. They will not allow you to move the foot. Okay. They immediately tell that I'm having catching pain. Okay. There. You know that it is spasm. So that means. You have to palpate the muscle, make it to be calm and position it in a comfort position without provoking the spasm for one minute. So that is actually called as the positional release techniques for spasm. The next stage in the myofascial dysfunction is the adhesions. That means fascia and the muscle, they're sticking to each other. Because of that, muscle is not able to work and fascia is not elastic, muscle is elastic. So if there is adhesion, muscle flexibility also will be reduced. Okay. It is a pseudo flexibility issue, pseudo tightness. There's actually, there is no shortening of muscle, but because it is sticking with the fascia, the muscle won't be getting lengthened. Okay. So you have to release the fascia. So similar to what is called as keep the palm, glide the fascia. Okay. Above the muscle. Okay. You can glide the fascia proximally and distally. These are all uh, direct and specific techniques. But if you want to give more direct techniques, you can give what is called as the ischemic compression, trigger point. You are identifying in the myofascial uh, structures. You are identifying the trigger point by means of four findings. Uh, what are that? When you palpate, the patient will be like, ah, jump saying. Okay, first one. And the next one, you will also find a palpable dot band. Okay. So within the muscle, the fibers have got interlocked and you find a hard dot band. Okay. And then the next one, you will also, when you are continuously pressing that area, the pain actually spreads to the central regions, which is called as referred pain. Okay. 
So these three are major findings. The minor finding is muscle twitching. Okay, little bit, little bit, little bit like this. Just adjacent to the region of the palpation when you are uh, palpating the tender point. Usually the trigger point will be it's a tender point in the neuromuscular junction or the motor point where the trigger point forms. Okay, so you at the trigger point, what is actually there is the fibers are actually interlocked. Okay, so you have to release that. So you give a manual pressure directly on the trigger point. Okay, maintain it. Okay, and you maintain it for a minute or so. At how much pressure? You have to maintain it at seven upon ten. Okay, not more than that, not less than that. So when you maintain that, the release starts slowly, slowly starts happening. So that is the myofascial release. Okay, so both the techniques. And the next, of course, is the muscle energy techniques, which is given for the tightness. So if I have a tendon Achilles, the calf muscle tightness, for example, knee is extended. Okay, I'm doing an ankle dorsiflexion. Range is limited. Whereas I flex the knee, the dorsiflexion range is good. Okay, when I extend the knee, the range is limited. So I know that it's the gastrocnemius which is tight. So what I do, I try MFR. Okay, I might do a facial glides, and after that I might see if the range improves. And after that, if it does not improve. I have to lengthen the muscle. How? Ask her to push my hand, okay, down, okay. So she gives a contraction, relax, and then when she relaxes, I take the foot up. Again, I ask her to push, and when she relaxes, relax, I take it up, okay. Again, she pushes with maximum force. When she relaxes. I am taking it up. This is called as hold relax. Hold relax is a technique of PNF, which can differentiate between capsular tightness versus muscle tightness. During hold relax, if the range is improving, it is muscle tightness. If the range does not improve, it has to be capsular tightness. Okay. But what is muscle energy technique is you don't give maximum force. Ask her to contract only 20 percentage of the maximum voluntary contraction. How to teach a patient to contract only 25 percent? That means you will ask a patient to hold your fingers for 100 percent maximum strength, and then tell them to reduce it to half. Okay, and then tell them to reduce it to further half of the half. So it becomes 25 percent. So once you have taught them in the hand. And you have ensured that the patient is able to reproduce the contraction 25 percentage isometric contraction, maximum contraction. As the same, ask her to push only with 25 percentage of, of the effort. So I take it to dorsiflexion, ask her to push 25 percent. She holds it for 10 seconds, then relax. Again, at the same position, I give another contraction, ask her to push. Okay. Second contraction. Like this, I give five contractions in a one position. Okay, I am not taking the range further and further with every repetition of contraction. Okay, I am taking it after five repetitions. So this is post isometric relaxation, it which comes under the muscle energy techniques. Okay, it's also a myofascial release, uh, myofascial manual techniques. And uh, other example of manual therapy or the myofascial techniques is the motor control retraining. Okay. For example, you are familiar with vastus medialis oblicus. Okay, you are familiar with the gluteal contraction. Okay, and uh, you know that hip, when it is internally rotating, it will create a pronation of the foot. Okay, when you are weight bearing, when you are internally rotating the hip, it will create a genu valgum, and then it will create a pes planus. Okay, when you are externally rotating the hip, it will create a genu varum, and it will also create a Pes cavus or the supination of the foot. So, what you have to understand here is if in any problem with the knee or foot and ankle, high level of evidence recommends hip, external rotators, and abductor strengthening, okay, which will always help balancing the forces in the ankle also. So, do not forget the fact that abductors, extensors, and external rotators of the hip has to be strengthened, mainly gluteus medius and minimus. Or even to do with the core muscles, okay, to be with the transverse abdominis, or be it the multifidus, which is posteriorly there, okay, or everything constitutes part of the motor control retraining, okay. Even the balance board training, where neuromuscular training is incorporated, is going to include motor control retraining, okay. 
you give a strengthening using a theraband for example it's a motor control free training okay but remember the load has to be less the muscle contraction effort has to be only 10 percentage don't give too much if you give more than that for strengthening it becomes it is not endurance okay if you want endurance you want the stabilizers to contract you should give only 10 percentage of the contraction so if i'm trying to improve the dorsiflexor strength i'll ask her to push my fingers with only 10 percentage of contraction and when she is pushing she pushes up okay when she is pushing this i'll maintain it for even one minute also because i want longer contraction not like just 10 seconds okay it's not for strength it's for endurance the same way for soleus it's another stabilizer of the ankle you want to strengthen that again what you do is you flex the knee and then you do the heel raises okay so if you keep the knee straight it will be gastronomous when you do the heel lift in standing okay but if you do knee bent and then you do the heel raise what will happen is it will be the soleus okay so different pathomechanical principles we have to apply and then we evaluate the system and then we apply the combination of the techniques of course for the neural techniques we have two one is the neural mobilization the other is the neurodynamics neural mobilization devised by david butler and neurodynamics divided by devised or founded by michael shecklock unfortunately it got divided also okay by mistake it came divided the truth is also it's divided so ultimately it was an indian who has to combine both the techniques and make it as neuro manual therapy okay what we do in neuro manual therapy is every nerve along its course you can check using what is called as a tunnel sign okay manually focusing and then also palpate the nerve along the course how do you know that it's a nerve tenderness versus a muscle tenderness okay so when you are palpating if you give contraction asking her to push outside okay outer side aversion and if there is tenderness it should be the peroni because i am contracting if contraction is reducing the pain here that means it's a structure which is deeper to the muscle and the next one to check whether it is the peroneal nerve tenderness okay it's a superficial peroneal nerve tenderness that means i can do a plantar flexion inversion it will aggravate the pain and also if i do slr it will aggravate the pain here okay or if she is in sitting i can ask her to do the neck flexion okay which is reproduce the slump test position so all this will denote it's a nerve tenderness okay and the nerves also can be massaged okay nerve massage along the area where uh, the adhesions are detected in the nerve and also you are familiar with the slr test okay we do the slr okay the straight leg raise okay uh, for the sciatic the same way for the foot also there are four tests which are basically what is called as first is the tibial nerve what you do is dorsiflexion aversion and then you do the slr okay and the next one is the sural nerve where you do the dorsiflexion inversion okay and then you do the slr okay and then next one common peroneal nerve you will do a plantar flexion inversion and then you will do the slr okay so the three major nerves of the foot you can use different combinations of movements and add the slr or the neck flexion in slump test position in high sitting to detect the neural mechanics okay when you are doing this test for example in uh, tibial nerve i do a dorsiflexion and aversion and then i do the slr but some patients, the dorsiflexion aversion itself, they will get heel pain. If that is the case, I have got symptoms in the mid range of the test. In other patients, like sports people, I will do dorsiflexion aversion, they will not get anything. I will lift the leg, SLR up to 30 degrees. When I maintain it for 10 seconds, then they will tell slight pain is there in the heel. That means they are getting pain in the end range. So for mid-range uh, symptom patients, I will use what is called as slider techniques. Whereas the end-range symptom patients, I will use a tensioner technique. Tensioner technique is same as the testing technique. So if I want to use a tension technique, what I will do? Dorsiflex and effort, and I will do the same 
SLR itself as an oscillatory mobilization. This is conventionally also called as the nerve strain, which was popularly explained by David Butler. Whereas, if I want to give a slider, I will opposite movements out. I will do dorsiflexion inversion whenever the leg is neutral. When the SLR is coming, I will do plantar flexion inversion. Okay, opposite to the dorsiflexion inversion. Okay, so that means when I am lowering dorsiflexion and aversion, when I am raising, I will do the plantar flexion inversion. So I repeat this as a uniform rhythmic movement. Then I am giving a slider technique for the tibial nerve. Okay, and remember tibial and common peroneal are antagonistic. So slider for one will become a tensioner for another. Okay, so this. You will understand the mechanics only when you are thorough with the course of the nerves and the muscles supplied by the nerve. Okay, so you have to elongate those muscles so that the nerve will be mechanically influenced. Okay, so this is one kind of a scenario. Hmm? If I want to give a treatment, for example, okay, I ask her to come to sideline facing me. Okay, so from this same situation. Uh, the subject is in sideline. Okay, I can uh, bend the lower leg so that the broad base of support is there. Upper leg I can keep knee flexed. I can extend the knee. It becomes an SLR. Okay, in the sideline. Okay, full SLR. Okay, and I can flexion inversion. Okay, for common peroneal. I can add the dorsiflexion inversion for the tibial. Dorsiflexion inversion for the sura. Okay. At the same time, if I want to give mobilization to the talus, mobilization to the calcaneum, okay, mobilization to the cuboid, mobilization to the metatarsals, I can use the same position. Okay. Same way, if I have to give a trigger point release to the gastronomius, I can directly give here or give the myofascial releases. Okay. So in a single position, I can give all the treatments. This should be the starting position for A, M, and M, T, ortho, myo, neuro, manual therapy. Okay. So, how do I do that? For example, I can combine, I can give what is called as I am trying to mobilize for tibial nerve, for example, but it is not only the tibial nerve problem. I have a trigger point in the gastronomius together with the tibial nerve strain. And also, I find ankle dorsiflexion range of motion is also limited. Why all three are there? Will be there. In every patient, don't expect only myofascial problem or articular problem. There will be combined problem. Okay. So, you have to evaluate all the three components and see which one is maximum involved and which one was first involved, which one is second. Okay. Some people will tell, my ankle is stiff. Okay. But when you examine the muscles, they will have trigger points also, in addition to the joint play being restricted. And also when you examine the nerve also, they will have symptoms, okay? With among palpation of nerves, for example. It may not create a numbness. Patients who come with numbness, you might get a trigger point in the muscles and you might also get a stiff joint. Okay, so articular, myofascial and neural, all the three are important. So in the same position, for example, I'm telling you an example of tibial nerve, with the restricted ankle the dorsiflexion and trigger point in the gastronomias. My choice will be, I have to keep the dorsiflexion aversion. SLR position is there, so I have loaded the nerve, neural, tibial nerve. Next, what I will do is, I have a posterior glide of the talus. Okay, So I maintain the foot in dorsiflexion aversion, take the other hand and give the posterior glide in the neural position already there, okay, neurodynamic position. In that, I am giving an articular mobilization, okay, not at rest when the subject is sleeping, okay. It is in the neural position, I am giving the joint mobilization, okay. At the same time, once I maintain this, okay, I can ask another therapist to actually give what is called as the trigger point release, okay, directly to the gastronomius. Because dorsiflexion and aversion definitely is going to keep the muscle in a lengthened position. So in that position, I can give the release. 
Remember, one main factor what you should take in consideration whenever you are using AM and MT is it's a combined technique. So it's not suitable for people in the beginning stages of rehabilitation. It's useful as a progression. Okay. And the next one, it's useful for multi-structural treatment. Okay, because we should not treat only the joint. Tomorrow we'll treat the muscle. Day after we'll treat the nerve. What happens? Patient comes back with the same problem. Okay. Today what is treated, tomorrow it will come back. Okay. So we should treat everything together. Because in a body, all structures are working together. All structures, the dysfunction also will be together. So they have to be evaluated together and they have to be treated together. Maybe if the trigger point is more, you can do only the myofascial release in the resting position for one week, for example. But later you should add the neural and the articular in order to make sure that functionally patient will be symptom free and uh, they will have unrestricted return to activity. Okay, So that's why AM and MT is very important. The second thing for the AM and MT is useful in sports persons, in athletes, especially that uh, what is called as you cannot reproduce the symptom only by muscle palpation. You cannot reproduce the symptom only by producing a glide. Okay? So you have to load the structures for a longer period of time in a combined loading, then only symptom will be reproduced. 